we go. Battery was dead. <laughs> hey, so I'm just getting ready to start um, putting this video together. So I want to throw a disclaimer out there that uh, there is some profanity in this video. I do apologize in advance. So if you have any little kids watching, um, maybe just watch it with them. Um, but the video that I'm posting up, it's going to be from George Cook. Uh, you can look up and see who George Cook is. Just do a Google search. It'll do way better than I um, than I will. But uh, yeah, so here's the video from a spay clave. Spay clave is just something that is, you know, you're casting different rods and lines to see what it is you like. And George went around along with other people from other shops to help people out. I learned a lot. He helped me out. I got some time with him one-on-one -on -one and uh, helped me out with my distance. And, um, you know, shout out to uh, Jeremiah from one of the local fly shops that helped me out also. So here you go. You know, I'm almost asleep. Right. right. So at what point will it no longer work? Right? Right. So let's, let's find out, you know, where... I mean, you, you, I'm hardly doing anything, right? Now, that's not how I would normally cast, but it's an exercise to find out just how little does it take to do that. And the answer is, if you're pulling that bottom hand, it doesn't take much. I mean, my normal cast would look about, about like that. Okay. I, I'm gonna put something on it just because I am, but, but, as these rods get smaller, and I mean, Joe, of course, loves them. He loves them big weapons. He always has. Yeah. But as these things get smaller, you got to get smaller. More compact? Yeah, you're going to start living in a phone Okay. Extension. Ed Ward was the first guy to coin that phrase, but it is. I mean, you're going to get small. But the minute you started pulling that bottom hand, your loop went from phone to phone to that. Okay. And it's all about that bottom. Steelhead fishing for rainbows, and in some cases, rainbows that are, you know, notably steelhead size. Okay. The state of Montana has kind of become a hotbed for streamer fishing. Like, we're all here today. But if we could do some time travel, like right this second, let's all go to the Yellowstone. Yeah. And swing streamers because right now is El Primo, depending on just how much snow is going. <clears throat> I think they got rocked this week. I know I got rocked in Anchorage yesterday because I got to I got to shovel my driveway yesterday on October <laughs> 15th. I was just utterly thrilled. <clears throat> this is like the Bahamas for yeah. So streamer fishing is the glamour game of trout. Everybody wants to do it, okay? It will work, but there's some things to know about. Alaska rainbows are notorious for eating the swung fly. Hmm. Love it. They're all about it. You can go to Montana and have one guy fishing a trout spade that's doing nothing but swinging, have a second guy He's doing a little strip or a little tug. Yeah. Generally speaking, in the northern Rockies, the guy tugging it or moving it is catching it. Mm. You don't need to do that in Alaska. Mm -hmm. You don't need to do it in New Zealand. I've, I've trout spayed in New Zealand on the South Island. Most critters will eat the swung fly. You go to Chile and Argentina, you ain't gonna hook shit all stupid if you don't move. <laughs> Those fish don't, they want it moving. Particularly brown trout. And brown trout as a whole kind of want it moving more so. So if you're gonna fish streamers, you're gonna get your head around doing some things that are a little out of the box, okay? The single greatest way to catch a bunch of trout on these small rods is to save your ball game for the evening. Mm fish the top of ripples and the main bodies swinging soft apples. That, if you want to put numbers up, you want grabs, that's the game. Everybody wants fish streamers because, hey, it's cool. 
and they look so cool. And they swim and they do this and that. You want to catch fish? Swing, soft end. Yakima is a perfect example of this. You go over there and swing streamers and strip them all day, maybe get a couple grass. Fish from 6.45 to dark, there's going to be more going on swinging those soft tackles than, than what went on all day. Just remember that, okay? Yes, sir. George, on swinging those, um, you're using a floating line, sink tip, or depends on the water? Great question. So, this little line is called a Rio Trout Spoon. It's actually a Scandi style line, it's 22 feet. Mm. And it plays with 10 foot conventional sink tips, 10 footers. It'll play with poly leaders. And when you have little 10 foot sink tips and little 10 foot poly leaders, you can get them in floating, intermediate, type three, hmm. type six. Poly leaders typically will be floating, intermediate. What's intermediate? About a 1.5 IPS. Okay. What's IPS? Inches per second. So it's a, it's a little creepy. Okay. Very good one for swinging soft tackles is that intermediate. Floater intermediate. Poly leaders typically will be intermediate 1.5, 2.6, 3.9, 5.6, 7.0. Obviously, 7.0 is a drop. Seven yeah. inches per second. So all those can play this game, right? As as an angler, if if you're running one of these Scandi style lines, and you want to kind of keep it simple right out of the gate, have a floater, have an intermediate, have a sink tip that's somewhere around three to you know three to five inches. You know, something that'll cut down a little bit, right? Trout, trout are apex predators, right? A steelhead, a summer run will move quite a ways for a fly, winter run generally won't. A lot of that's water temperature. Trout generally is going to move for the fly. So getting down is not, is critical with them because they'll change. They're, they're active, right? They're particularly active on a, on a moved flock, okay? But if you have a little Skagit set up on one of these little guys, you're going to end up, you know, with XYZ sink tips, okay? And on the Skagit setups, you, you can run little sink tips, little mows. Everybody know what the mows are? M-O-W? Well, that's a whole separate talk for today. It's named after the three guys who came up with it. Mike McCune, Scott O'Donnell, Ed Ward. Oh. The three spanketeers, as I call them. And M.O.W., despite the fact it's named after that, a lot of people just think it's Mo shit for you. <laughs> Which it kind of is. Okay. I mean, as a sales rep, I'm trying to infect you with spay items. And there ain't no vaccine for that one. <laughs> so, okay. So, sink tips on these little rods. There is a point of no return. How do I know this? I have broken some trout spay rods in Alaska because I just couldn't help myself. And I put on just a little too much sink tip. Okay? Most spay rods don't respond well to sink tips under nine feet. Mm. Nine feet's kind of the DMZ of castability on a general spay rod. On the little guys, 10 feet's kind of the end of the road. That's as far as you get greedy like me and you go 11, you're going to watch yourself break your freeway. Snap, like a 22 shot. <laughs> okay? So remember that a 10 foot sink tip is about it on the 
two, three, four way crowd space. They are the one rods where you can take the 10 footer and bring her down and cut her at seven and a half or seven. And it will, because the scale is smaller, it will play them. You put a seven foot sink dip on your 13 foot eight weight, it will be a boomerang. You'll cast it, it'll come right back to you. It's terrible. But on the little guys, you can scale down and play that game. Too much weight, just weight. And horse in the cast. Oh yeah, I think I made it three cast with an 11 foot. Uh, tight T11. T11, 11 foot was... So is the, is the idea there, you, know, you got so much line in the water, you have to pick it up and drag it and try to get it back up to the surface to make that next cast. You have this huge sink tip, right? And it just, it's dragging down on that really thin line. It's, it doesn't pop, right? Well, it, it's it's obviously a challenge to move that, yeah, right? Yeah, right, because you have an 11 foot rod or 11 and a half foot rod. Correct. So just remember on these little guys, 10 feet's kind of our max critter on a sink tip. But those are the rods that you can come back and cut it eight, cut it seven and a half, cut it seven. Probably could still play at six. Probably gets poofy at five. Okay. You know, because they get boomerangy where they where they turn over, but then the sink tip hits first mm -hmm. and then the comes over the top of it. And it's really it'll make you think you don't know how to cast. It's that bad. But just remember that. 10 footers kind of the DMZ on these little guys. Alright? Leaders. Talk about leaders. So on a sink tip, I'm gonna run a miniature version of a steelhead leader. If my standard steelhead leader overall is is 54 inches on a sink tip say 27 inches at 20 pound to 27 inches at 12 pound, okay? That's my typical sink tip, okay? Which in reality is about palm to palm or what I'd like to think is a pretty decent Alaska moose, okay? <laughs> right? I will run that same thing on these just scaled down, okay? Instead of 20, 12, I might go 1x, 3x. I might go 2x, 4x. Okay? Because when we start fishing those saw tackles, you're probably not going to get away beyond 3x. 3x probably as heavy as you're going to fish. Okay? Because that idea didn't leave just because you went from a single hander to this. That fly and the associated tip. It, None of that changed, right? Okay. So on a sink tip, 54 inches, scale it. You know, scale it to what we're doing. Flies, fishery, stuff that you've been doing with a single hander, it's now transfers to this. Uh, poly leaders, which have an extruded mono, they're they're a mono-based poly, so they're basically a, a little fly line but they're mono four, and you tie tip it to them, you can scale that. Usually most poly leaders are around either 12 or 24 pound cap, okay? 12 is fine for for trout endeavors, okay? So you just have schools of like poly leaders? No, poly leaders are, are like this little guy right here. Is that... That's one right there, and it's based, that's an intermediate. And basically, you're tying tip it to the extruded mono that comes out of the poly leaf. Okay. Now, most people, if if you got a 12 pound base to that poly leader, you could basically run. You could either loop it. Surgeon's not something to it. You could two stage it. You could you could literally run an equivalent mono to it and then taper off of that. Most people tend to just go whatever they're gonna run for tipping right off, okay? But you, you got some options there. 
I'm a big believer in tapering things. And the reason why I'm a big believer in it is that transition power and turnover works best off a tapered format. It's, it's hard to run, you know, thread off the fire hose <laughs> and think it's going to turn. That's a good point, yeah. But if you transition it, you put the garden hose to the fire hose, that pup has got a better chance of turning and finishing. That's good. Yes, sir. That's, well, that's, you know what? That's a really great comment. So what, what he asked you guys was, so say you got a sink tip that, say the water is from me to the gravel, right? And your sink tip is cut in, and you've got X liter, and your fly might be higher than the sink tip. That, by the way, is the number one reason why people don't catch winter run steel eggs. <laughs> right there. Hence, weighted flies, right? Can you get your fly to come down with that sink tip if the leader's shorter? The answer is yes. But weight on that fly in the form of little barbell eyes, a bead head, a tungsten bead head, a little tiny cone, you know, a little sneaky tiny split shot a foot in front of the fly. There's all sorts of ways. Okay, but yeah, that's a consideration. I'm not as worried about that with Trouty as I am with Steelhead or Chinooks. The Chinooks and Winter Run Steelhead, that's a real, real issue. Okay, so 54 inches off a sink tip is a good, is a good base. And whether you tie that thing and it's 27 and 27 or 24 and 24, Nobody cares. Pick one, run it. Okay? But don't, what you don't want is seven and a half, eight, nine feet of leader coming off the sink tip. That's what you don't want. Mm -hmm. Because that's when you get the real upgrade. <clears throat> okay? How many of you guys remember the Kaufman store in Bellevue? Side you, Suzanne. <laughs> well, I, I worked there for years back when that was on 148. And we would, the number one reason guys would not catch steelhead where they went, they made the transition from trout angler, got steelhead gear, got sink tips, were running the same nine foot leaders that they were running on their six weight for trout. They were running those on their sink tip for steelhead. Mm. And they were never hooking shit all through them. Because sink tips here, flies way up here, completely missed the purpose. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't long after talking to a couple of those guys that we started, you know, it became a speech about leader length, right? So that's that, okay? All right? So, little rods, little game. I've seen today a Chinook roll. So there's some critters in here. And I will be willing to up there, upstream where those pilings are, which is where I caught my first two steelhead as a 10th grader in Newport Eye. I promise you there's some summer runs laying up by those pilings today. Largely reachable with just spoons. <laughs> what are those? Yeah. <laughs> That's rifle hunt. <laughs> Not ours. Okay. All right, so a lot of folks here today have never cast Bay Rock. In fact, um, I think it's probably close to 50%. And you've come to the right place. I mean, we, we can get you rolling. And the right guy to teach us. Yeah, turns out there's <laughs> a couple here. So, when you pick up one of these little guys versus, say, a 13 foot 7 or an 8, again, the first thing is think scale down. Everything's going to get smaller. Your movements, 
your octane, everything get, scales down. See that orange? You guys see that? Light's kind of interesting. That's the back of a head. And whether it's a Scandi style line or it's gadget, the back of a head transitions to a running line. The white is a running line. The orange signifies the back of the head. Okay? So there's always going to be an overhang equation on any spay rod. If I went right to there, I'm essentially two feet into the head. Okay? That would be considered choked up. I'll tell you what, not fun. I broke him off. So I don't fish two flies because of that. Heck of it. But it's not stopping you. You can do it. Streamer wise. I'm gonna mend that one. And my men could accomplish two purposes. Primary purpose of the men is to sink the fly. Allow that fly hit, drop. Men allows the drop, fly engages, it's deep, it probably has some up plane in the swing, but it gains some depth. The other reason to mend is to get a straight edge. So say we get an upstream wind. What an upstream wind tends to do to the spay angler, regardless of steelhead tackle, this, doesn't matter. You go to make a cast, upstream wind tends, it won't do it right here, but imagine that instead of that thing going straight, that thing went out and then hooked up. It's like a question mark. It's like the Riddler left Batman to come forward. <laughs> okay? So there's, there's this big question mark. I don't want the question mark because the fly in that scenario is behind the line. And it's going to come down like that face first versus broadside. So the mend, in that case, not only sinks the fly, but it returns the line to a straight edge. Okay? Upstream wind is really problematic on the hook. We don't want the hook. We need to fight the Riddler. Okay? That streamer can swing, or that streamer can have some options. I could do the a tug as it swings. And really all I'm doing because it would be taut, this isn't taut, I could just tug, kind of violin it back, tug. And what that fly's doing, it's swinging but it's going. Or I could literally I could literally strip it. And I would choose to do that in some scenarios where I mend it, it sunk, and now as it swings, I'm gonna go. So that thing's swinging and going. And there's definitely some trout in some regions, the Northern Rockies, great example, if the grounds, they want that fly moving. They're far more interested in a moving fly than they are a swung fly. Alaska, they'll eat it all day. New Zealand, they'll eat it. Argentina and Chile, eh -eh. strip or bust. Okay? Questions? Yes, sir. Can you talk to us about um, bloody L's? 
and maybe kind of show what that looks like. Mm -hmm. Please and thank you. So, bloody hell is an English term. <laughs> it has to do with your line within the structure of the cast. If I make that cut, but I cut the corner, I end up with a line that forms an L, and in that L, the L is generally a dead line. A dead line has to be restarted. So this kind of brings up, that's a great question, it's a great, it's a, it's a definite phenomenon is most spay casts are a continual motion, okay? There are some that have what's called a sustained anchor, okay? The hardest spay cast to learn and to master looks like the easiest one possible. Mm called a single spec. Looks like this. Single hardest cast learn. I used to teach it as the first cast in classes. I started teaching in 1991. You'll never believe how I got ready for my first class. <laughs> but we used to teach that cast because the Europeans, they demand that out of a spay cast. If you can't single spay, you ain't shit. Go home. Go home, you they, That is a prerequisite cast in the annals of, of, of spay history. That's the hardest cast to learn. I know it looked easy. It ought to be easy. I got 30 some years on it. I should be able to do it. <laughs> That's a hard one. The easiest cast is a double spin, which you saw a few minutes ago, both left hand up, Jack hand. Okay? I'll tell you the story. How I taught my first class. This is a humdinger. So I had a dealer, Gary Sandstrom, who some of you may remember from the morning hatch at Tacoma. He goes, Can you teach us May class? I was like, Why sure? <laughs> I think I rounded up five rods. I think I found some double taper lines, which I'd gotten in British Columbia, or maybe Quebec, I don't even remember. And I thought, man, I know there's a single span, I know there's a double span, I don't know what else there is. So I got this, this, this uh, VCR with a tape, and this guy from England by the name of Hugh Falk. Hugh Falk is on casting. On a Friday at 3 o'clock, I played it. At 4, I played it a second time. Next morning, I taught a class. <laughs> nice. And all we did was single spay and double spay. Double spay was really easy to learn. <clears throat> single spay was like, oh my god. Like trying to get linemen to run a 4 5 40. <laughs> it just wasn't happening. Yeah. So. But you should work on all these casts. And this, the soft tackle game really lends itself to a single spay based on just simplicity. And here's that single spay. And when you're not mending, you literally can take this thing and come down a run and play a set line. So I can set this thing up right about there. Come down, pull, pull, swing, step. I could, I would never come out of that cast. It would just, I'd be like a machine coming down with that single spin. I'd be super efficient, energy efficient, Place in 70 degree cast, no mend, it just be as slick as it can be. So that is a cast, and if anybody wants to try it today, ask me, but I assure you, 
That's the hardest spade cast of all to learn. It looks so simple. Now, occasionally somebody will get it right out of the gate, and you know why they get it? It's because they've been running around with a single hander for years, mm. going like this. Well, that single hander didn't even know they were doing it. Those are the ones that normally get it pretty quick, believe it or not. Okay? Other questions? Ah, great, great, great question. So when the switch rod thing really got rolling, 2005, 2007, people were fishing them off the beaches, Puget Sound, and some of them were casting them single-handed overhead, some were casting double-handed overhead, some were spay casting in the surf with kind of a modified single spay switch cast sort of move. Some, some folks would be on the beach and you'd see them kind of do a little switch cast. It might go like that and then pick it up and go pull, pull, because you could throw a huge amount of line, right? You'd see guys in pontoon boats over in eastern Washington in their pontoon boat with a switch rod, baby spay, and they come right off the side of that pontoon and make spay cast. Now the reality of lakes and beaches is I'll take the nine and a half foot six weight single hander over this every time. It just fundamentally is a better tool. Hmm. But it's not like you can't use this in lakes it's not like you can't use it on the beach. Now, one thing you'll find with lakes, is turns out there's no current, right? Right. So one of the ways you end up casting something like this in a lake, because this is basically a lake today, right here, you would come down, get the water, check your back cast, see what you got for room, and what you end up doing is kind of this Perry Pope sort of thing where you're going to stack this line here, you're going to come back, and you're going to fire it. And it's, you can throw some on, no doubt. I mean, you're probably not going to make a big sweep shot, so, you know, I might end up doing a little snap P there, a little poke, boom, boom. Yeah, I can fish lakes. I've done it. It, it was more novel than anything because, again, I'm taking that nine and a half foot five or six weight every time lake fishing. That's the weapon of choice. Yes, Suzanne? How about off a boat? I've been watching on the Upper Columbia, some of them using space. Yeah. Off a boat. I mean, is there anything? Yeah, I mean, if you're in an anchored boat on a river, you could. You could actually run two people with these. The person on the bow, say we're, we're anchored river left, just like this. The person on the bow could throw a snap tee. He's gonna have to carve it right off the bow. The person on the back could throw a cack-handed double spay. Of course, all this shit is wind dependent, right? <laughs> all sounds good till it's not. Right. But yeah, you could do that. The problem with spay rods and boats, and you'll find this out relatively quickly when you're not, you know, dealing with tiny town. You start to deal with these critters, that 11 feet out of that boat is troublesome in terms of how do I land this? It's like, you know, I got to go to the back to the front upper offside to net that fish off the back corner. So you can do all this stuff, but there's going to be challenges. There's going to be challenges. And believe me, you're going to need a netter in the boat playing with one of these. Because that's a prescription to break your rod without somebody on a net. Mm, it's good to know. So it's going to get out of hand. Too much weight without help. Long. Yeah.
Any other questions? Anything you want to see again? Can you show us a uh, Perry Poke and kind of break that down? The Perry Poke. Perry Poke was developed by a guy named Carl Perry from Gresham, Oregon. Mm. Now, Carl did not wake up on a Saturday and go, I'm going to invent a cast. <laughs> no, Carl blew a single spec. And out of frustration, made a move that became a cast which is pretty legendary these days. It's called the Perry Poke, developed by Carl Perry, made famous by one Ed Ward. So here's how Carl came up with the Perry Poke. Blew a single spay, dumped it in frustration, came back in a D loop and hucked. So then he started to refine it, but Ed Ward, who I'm sure a lot of you know that name, Ed turned this into the most elegant, energy efficient cast. It's one of the great ones. Here's what it looks like when done properly. Mark of the cast is that it is a complete setup to throw a perfectly perpendicular full D loop completely directionally perpendicular off you. It will throw the straightest line you've ever seen. Mm. It will throw a very far line. It is a great cast in frog water. Mm. It is a super bad call up in that quick water. Mm, okay. Okay, because of the speed, the timing. So watch this again. So again, Carl developed this off a mistake. Drag. So, the move here, and it's somewhat of an optical illusion, which you will see when you do this in a little faster water, not the ultra fast, but faster than the frog pond, is that I'm going to drag that fly somewhere between three, four feet below me to maybe right to me. The optical illusion. is that if you leave it short, you're like, I can't throw that off this shoulder. But when you make the poke, the poke will drag it up to 90 degrees or 100 degrees. Okay. The poke, it's, it's kind of somewhat of this funky illusion, but when you poke, that pup will move. Ideally, you want to get it within two feet of it. Right there. Oh, so when you poke, you're going to you want to go that way. If you want to really look like the guy who knows what he's doing, you'll shift out, he loop, fire. High line speed. Highly perpendicular directional acuity. So if you have a downstream wind, then if you tap that poke down on this side? I'd personally just throw a, just a, throw a double spay and get on with it. Okay. okay. Now, there's another cast called the Wombat. The Wombat cast. The Wombat's a real individual. His name is Brian Kite. He's known as the Wombat. And Ed Ward, back in his guiding days on the Connect Talk, he and Brian Kite 
Eric Newfeld, the, the Winston Sims rep, they were all guiding up there at the same time. Ed tried to teach the wombat how to do the poke. And the wombat was struggling, and largely the wombat was struggling because of the type of line he had. Because mm. Ed Ward had all these zany, you know, chop shop, sketched heads that only he and like three other guys had. And everybody else would run around with Rio wind cutters, which were 53 foot heads versus Ed running around with these 27 foot little critters that only Ed, Scott Howe, and Scott O'Donnell had. And they were real happy that they only had them and nobody else did. And they kind of sort of rubbed it in everybody's faces. And eventually we got the formula and we were able to mass produce them so that all could have. But the wombat, he would, he would make this move and go too far. Or he'd make this move and he'd be short, way short. And I actually saw this when it occurred. Ed Ward working with the wombat. Wombat ain't getting it again today. Ed Ward walks off. I'm standing like over there. And I watch the wombat do this. Wombat kind of looks around, kind of checks it. He goes, snap T. Oh, see you bye. <laughs> so he used the snap T to get the anchor because he couldn't get the, the poke right, largely because he had a 53 foot head. It was just a struggle. So the Wombat cast is a hybrid of the snap T and the Perry poke. And it's a good one. And it's, you know, people. You know, sometimes people will say, well, George, why'd you throw a wombat? You could have just thrown a snap tee. Yeah? Hey, man, if you're out there eight, nine, ten hours of this, you think you're throwing fastballs for nine innings? <laughs> you're not. Other stuff is cool. Other stuff breaks up the monotony of, of all these casts. So the Wombat cast works off a snap T to establish anchor, hope to establish the perpendicular setup, he moved, fire. It's another tool in the box. But that's the beloved Wombat cast. Okay? You guys want to see the Perry Poke? If you're out here, holler at me, wave me down, I'll come show it to you. It's got a lot of little idiosyncrasy to it that that really makes it come together and it might require a little shoulder time. Awesome. Okay? Any other questions? Any answers? <laughs> Thanks for coming. Thanks, George. Appreciate it. Fish, and this is, you know, something I talked to Joe with, is the challenge I had with pinks this year is that you know, I would catch them down on the swing and then I'd lift the rod. And I kept missing and missing them. But then the minute that I would let them go down and let them run a little bit, then reel, then I was hooking them. So my question with that is that if we're coming down this way, river left, and we hook up, are we setting the hook this way to the bank? And how come we lose the fish when we set up? Are we ripping it out of their mouth? So what I'll tell you is this. If you can have on trout, steelhead, kings, chums, anything that ate a swung fly. Jim Teeny once said to me, he said, if you land 50%, you should be joyful. I'll tell you, I think you should be joyful. I think 65% is a little actually doable. But you will have days. Thank you, David. Um, you will have days where I've had days on Kings where I went three for ten. Next day I went nine for ten. Mm. When I go nine for ten, I know what's coming day three. <laughs> it's gonna be four for eight. Because the shit 
tense. So if, if you're 65%, you should be joyful. I mean, you just should be, because that's what's realistic. But to answer your question, it, it all comes down to how that fish, what he does when he eats the fly. Mm. So there's, there's two things I'll tell you. One, let him chew the gum, which okay. you already learned, right? And, and typically what, what a, a steelhead or a king, let me use your jacket as an exit, just, yeah, I'm not gonna rip your arm off. <laughs> but they're gonna go like this, they go. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. But what's actually happening there is I learned more about trying to fly fish kings by being a gear fishing guide in Alaska. Okay. I learned a lot. That set the tone for my ability to fly fishing, right? Because the gear guys are the most dangerous cats on the river. There's no getting around them, mm -hmm. right? So we learned this plug fishing and, you know, guiding and talking to clients with a plug rod, with a, you know, with a quick fish or a hot shot. The reason why those guides put them in rod holders is to keep you grubby hands off the rod. Mm. And the reason why they don't want you touching it, they want that in a rod holder because that, that what those kings and steel I do is they grab, they go, drop, drop, oh. drop, turn. Interesting, okay. So when you feel a fish going, he's grabbing, drop. And so with a fly, Fly's going, you know, okay, I'm a, I'm a king. Here comes the fly. Ah, uh, okay. And the big pull is the... The head turn. The turn. Okay. And if they turn, so it's swinging this way, if he eats it and goes that way, that's the one that... The ones that go in here usually come off. The ones that are on the outside, usually those are the ones that come off right there and you're like, I got all the way here and that. <laughs> but boy, when they, they, they grab, drop, grab, drop, grab, turn. And the ones that go here are the ones that go on the roof of the mouth, generally land. Okay. So when you lose them, guys, you're you're gonna you're just gonna you just there'll be days where you're just like, how the field go mess out? Because it's gonna go on right there, and it's cause you're gonna you're gonna lose that fish. That fish was getting on. I see. Okay. But when the ones that you land, you know, always when you land one, regardless of what it is, trout, steelhead, salmon, whatever, you pull that hook out. Pay attention to where it was and yeah. how it was. And you'll have some that they weren't getting on, they were, had no chance of getting on, mm -hmm. other than the break. You'll have others where you're like, I've landed them kings where that owner cutting hook had created a tab of skin out like that, and the hook was in between my fingers, right? Oh, wow. And so all it was holding it was that string mm. of skin. Is it just like, how did I land? Wow, that was lucky. Right. The pendulum's going to swing the other way coming forth. Right. Maybe. It's funny because I always assume, maybe for no good reason, that pulling them by the look of the fly is a doable thing. It's going past fast. It sort of looks like the fly is not as fresh as they're going, and so they're going to go for it. But the idea that they would take it and let go, take it, let go, you'd think once it's in their mouth, it's, it's, everything's wrong. It's the wrong so, texture. It's the wrong taste. Yeah, we learned wrong, this. The, but the, they go for it. We, got, so. we learned this plug fishing. Yeah. And that's why those guys put those rods and rod holders because what they're trying to teach the client with a, with a plug is so, so a plug like a hot shot or a quick fish is when it's fishing rods like that, right? And what, what happens is you'll watch it go and it'll come right back. And are those, and, and are so those what's going on? So seriously, it's going, it's going. Bum, 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 and then what happens is, what happens is it'll go slack, hmm. 
then it will bury. Okay. And that's that fish going grab, drop, grab, drop, grab, swim forward, slack rod, oh, turn, I see. Okay. and it buries. That's when they want you to grab it. And those are, and those so are those we learned that plug fishing, and then you, you're fly fishing and you're going, you know, your first, you know, your first time you do that, you're Yep. Not a guilty. And then boom, boom. And then boom. And sometimes, you know, when I'm fishing kings for two weeks on the Nishgak, inevitably I, I get a fish that just goes boom, boom. He, he only grabbed it once, lost interest, left. You'll get a, a boom, boom. That's a grab, drop, mm -hmm. grab, drop, leaves. It's the one the most. Sometimes it's just one heroic, they just grab and go. Right. But most of them are like, boom, 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 boom. Okay. And then are those, those kinds of, those species, are they, in those scenarios, are they um, going to the fly to eat or are they going to fly because they're mad? Like trout, I assume, are always eating, or as I thought, I've heard they're eating. They're eating. So, so, so I, I'd say that, I'd say that steelhead are just react they're largely reacting to behavior Actual. in the natal river that they had as a par a little guy when they went out what did you call that a par a par oh okay P -A -R -R. And there's a whole shit pile of them in here right now and schnook par oh okay you know when when guys come out and trout fish out here with dry like if you walked up the raging and fished you know and size 14 Adams parachute and yeah. cut a bunch of little rainbow those are little steel okay or little chinooks right <clears throat> so you're kind of roughing up the wrong guys in a way right, right. but that's how those takes are and it, it just those fish that those ones that that grab and do that big turn those are the ones you tend to get okay but but I'm telling you if you hook 10 and land six that's, you're kind of playing at the, the high, you're playing a high, you're pitching pretty good ball. Okay, so then just to reiterate, as the fish is coming down at the swing and you've hooked them, you are hook setting this way? So what I'm doing is, you know, I'm swinging with the fly. Okay. I'm swinging that way, not, not because I'm particularly worried about losing them going up, mm -hmm. I got more force and speed coming this way. I see. As a right hander. Okay. That makes that sense. Makes yeah. Sense. Yeah. That's just that. You're not putting much into that one. You. I see. And and yeah, I I think the coming up, but I, it's just so dependent on how that fish sure. turned on that thing. It's, I'm just saying in general. Yeah, I think if you come to the bank, but the big thing is let them chew the gum. Be patient. And don't hit them until they bury it. Okay. It's, again, I mean, I learned it plug fishing and it was just damn spot ass on as what's going on. Okay. Grab drop, grab drop, grab turn. And That's why- That's exactly what's going on. Why do you think they're grab dropping? Are they like a dog curious using their mouth? Well, you can, you can watch some of these cats. Like there's a guy that when he when he's down here i think he lives outside gig harbor his name is rob ensley in fact he's on that radio show um i think on kjr he's often the, the host of that morning saturday morning fishing outdoor. oh yeah his name is rob ensley okay if you go on his instagram you'll, you'll watch he's got a fair amount of footage of chinooks mm you know, off downriggers where he's able to film it. Oh, cool. And you'll watch them on herring do the same shit. You'd think, you know, you'd think they'd be like a largemouth bass that just come 